the Center for Practice Excellence speaker series. My name is Zubin Austin and I am the academic director for the center and we're glad to have you with us. Before we get started, we have more and more new faces joining us. So I'd like to just provide a quick introduction of who we are at the Center for Practice Excellence and what we do. CPE or the Center for Practice Excellence at the uh, Leslie Dent Faculty of Pharmacy utilizes leading edge medication management research and innovation to drive educational programs and practice to revolutionize patient care. Our tagline has been Center for Practice Excellence, unleashing the potential of pharmacists to transform the care of patients. We bring together practitioners, researchers, staff, students, and professionals from all across the world. And one of our major activities is hosting the speaker series event as we are doing so today. I'm very excited to uh, welcome our speaker series uh, guests for today from the Center for Effective Practice. Interestingly enough, six years ago, when the Center for Practice Excellence, or CPE, began, we started getting mail that was addressed for the Center for Effective Practice, CEP. We got that all sorted out eventually, but it points to the value of both effective and excellent practice. And I look forward to our speakers today helping us understand this through their work in academic detailing. Let me turn it over to the Administrative Director for the Center, Annalise Mathers, to introduce our speakers and our topic for today. Over to you, Annalise. Thank you so much, Zubin, and thank you for giving that little anecdote about um, the similarity yet difference between the two acronyms of, of our center and the center that Trish and Nicole will be speaking to us about today. Um, pleasure to see lots of familiar faces and some new faces online. Um, and I'll get us started. So um, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. For my own path to truth and reconciliation, I personally have benefited as a settler from living on this land in Treaty 13 here in Toronto, as well as throughout my education and training on the land in Ottawa and British Columbia. I'm grateful to work towards a deeper understanding of the history that has brought myself and all of us to reside on this land and to work towards creating environments of mutual respect and learning. So as Zubin mentioned, today's event is focused on academic detailing and knowledge translation opportunities for pharmacists. This session is done in collaboration with the Center for Effective Practice. And we have the pleasure of having Trish and Nicole join us today, um, as well as Alex, who will be providing some remarks after Trish and Nicole's presentation. Um, uh, throughout the presentation and, and throughout Alex's remarks, we'll invite people in the audience to type their questions or comments into the chat box, just using the Zoom chat box feature. Um, and then we'll get to those at the end of today's session. So just introducing our presenters. Um, Trish Ron is a hospital pharmacist who currently practices at Mount Sinai Hospital, in addition to her work as an academic detailer and clinical service director. She has extensive experience in the hospital pharmacy, continuing education for health professionals, critical appraisal of health literature, medical writing, and patient health coaching programs. She's also a certified health coach specializing in health behavior change. Trish obtained her pharmacy degree and later her doctor of pharmacy from the University of Toronto. Nicole Seymour is experienced in both inpatient and outpatient hospital pharmacy, family health teams, and academia. She's been an academic detailer with, the, with CEP for four and a half years and currently also works for the St. Thomas Elgin General Hospital and the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Nicole's experience in mental health, nephrology, and geriatrics has inspired her passion for improving transitions in care. Nicole obtained her doctor of pharmacy from the University of Waterloo. So with that said, I will turn it over to Trish and Nicole and let them get started. Thanks for joining everyone. Thanks, Annalise, and thank you, Zubin, for the kind introduction, and thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, we're happy today to be able to present to you on our Center for Effective Practice Academic Detailing and Knowledge Translation Services, and to speak a little bit about the opportunities for pharmacists. So first of all, we'll give you a little introduction to the center and what we're all about. Um, and then I'll quickly outline our knowledge translation and primary care initiative. 
Nicole and I will take you through um, a quick overview of our academic detailing service with some examples of the types of materials and discussions that we have during our academic detailing visits. And finally, we'll have a bit of a discussion around future directions. Then we're happy to invite our discussant, Alex Crawley, who will uh, take us through a bit of a uh, a bit of a reflection on what's been heard in terms of the presentation and the questions and uh, help us reflect on future directions and finally welcome some questions and answers. So before we continue, I also wanted to offer a land acknowledgement from the location where I'm at as well as Nicole. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chip Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, over to you, Nicole. Oh, thanks, Trish. I'm in London, Ontario, which is the territory of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawik, and Chenongtan nations. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so a little introduction to CEP and who we are. Um, so we're established in 2004, and we've currently grown to be one of the largest independent, not-for-profit knowledge translation organizations for primary care. Um, we actually had our beginning through family medicine at U of T, and uh, this organization has since branched off. Um, and now we are sort of having the goal of improving care for patients by bridging the gap between evidence and practice. So we like to be evidence informed and yet also uh, focus on practical solutions to help providers. Sometimes we say that we're uh, by providers for providers. Um, as you'll see when we talk about academic detailing, many of us are, uh, well, all of us are practicing pharmacists. So um, we're able to utilize that to sort of help with interdisciplinary collaboration. So with that, I'll just outline a few things that we do within our center. Um, the first part of this is uh, research and evaluation. Uh, in terms of the services that we offer, clinical tools, including digital tools, educational outreach, including the academic detailing, as well as engaging with uh, different types of healthcare providers in every phase of our work, including the development, and also partnering with key stakeholders um, to sort of help make sure we reach our intended audience. And the most recent addition to our, our, our goals and the way we're working is uh, to include diversity, accessibility, equity, inclusion, and respect in everything that we do. That's a really important goal for us and something that we've lately started working towards in all of our tools. So a bit of a work in progress, but something that we're all very committed to. Um, we have engaged with a number of different stakeholders. Uh, you'll see just some of them down below. There's about 100 altogether. We've had more than, and I've actually had some new data come in that there's more than 1,100 physicians now who've been engaged with academic detailing. And some of you may uh, know of CEP through the COVID Resource Center that we developed back when COVID first came out. Um, we had to very rapidly pivot from uh, the topics that we were working on to develop a COVID resource. And since then, we've had over 143,000 downloads of that. Um, many, many physicians and other care providers have used the resource. And uh, we had it up and running. We started March 16th and by early April, we had it running. So it was a, a real joint effort with our whole team to sort of get that going. Um, our first initiative that I'd like to, to talk about is our knowledge translation in primary care. So this is about taking information from guidelines and evidence and sort of translating it into best practices in a way that's very practical and accessible for healthcare providers. So what we're doing is supporting uh, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, and also other healthcare providers as well, such as pharmacists and nurses, by developing clinical tools and information resources to help in their daily practice. So we recognize um, that as part of this, we are going to be engaging in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect initiative that may involve some unlearning and undoing practices, and that we are sort of committed to that journey that we're starting to undergo. So. A little example of some of the tools that you can see at our, our website, which is cep.health. Um, you can see the COVID Resource Center. We also have supports for the Ontario health teams. Um, as well, you may be familiar with some of our other tools, such as there's a core back and core neck that a lot of people like using. Um, we also have an updated medical assistance and dying tool and uh, tools for adults and uh, youth mental health. So just a few samplings of the offers of tools that we have um, as well. This is a sample of what our COVID Resource Center 
offers. Again, we've had so many downloads of this in the past couple of years. If you're interested in joining our mailing list and, and didn't sign up in the event registration, you can include your name and email in the chat and uh, you can be notified of the CEP newsletter that has new tools coming out. Here is just an example of the 28 clinical tools that are widely used by Ontario providers. Uh, the topics are chosen based on input from our stakeholders in primary care to address areas of need where there is new evidence, a lack of available tools, or important practice gaps. And you can see there's quite a few um, over a wide range of topics of interest to primary care. We go through a rigorous tool development process that involves a lot of interprofessional collaboration. Each tool is developed by collaborating with a multidisciplinary group, including pharmacists, other healthcare professionals, caregivers, and patients in the tool development process. There are many opportunities for pharmacists to get involved as part of our advisory group or in reviewing our tools. The process starts with identifying a working group and clinical leads. Next, we do an environmental scan of available evidence and resources. We do a needs assessment and review of the scope of the topic and determine what the contents of the tool will be. Then we develop the content and prototype a design um, with our user experience experts. And finally, we user test that amongst not only healthcare practitioners, but also caregivers and people with lived experience of the condition. Uh, finally, the tool is disseminated and we do track how often it's used and the results of evaluations and feedback. We update the tools at different intervals based on funding and practice needs. This is just an example of one of our tools, a practical example. We're going to do a quick walkthrough of one of our tools for type 2 diabetes, our insulin therapy tool. As you can see, we have a couple of other diabetes tools as well. So this, um, not to be alarmed by the amount of content, and just as a bit of a caveat here, we are uh, not sending you back to school. There's not gonna be a test and there's no need to really absorb um, any of the content here. More of a demonstration of the type of content and the type of graphics and layout that you'll see in our tools. And you'll notice that the tools, they're on our website so they can be seen through HTML. Some also have a PDF printable version. And then there's always a little menu where you can skip to different parts of the tool. So again, not trying to focus on any elements of the content, but just to show the type of features that we have. This is an example of one of our drug charts. Um, you can see there's a lot of detail here. And again, it's the provider's choice whether they want to refer to this, but it has a lot of practical information on coverage, dosage forms, and um, kind of key features of each of these drugs. It may be important with decision-making with the patients. And we also talk about adverse events. As well, um, affordability and environmental impact are often top of mind for the tools um, that we develop because they're so important to our clinicians that we work with. This is another example of a type of visual that we do with a cost chart. And here we're trying to encourage sort of a rational choice of reasonable cost-effective therapies. And here the point is about considering a biosimilar insulin. And this is one of the points that we do in our detailing discussions with physicians and now nurse practitioners. Another example of a, um, we like to have vivid infographics and pictures just to make sure there's not too much worriness going on to allow you know, visual learners to get a good picture of, of the important points. Another example are talking points where we offer the clinicians some scripts that they can potentially use during difficult conversations with their patients and um, a section on environmental impact on how people can sort of reduce that impact when prescribing. There's another aspect of our um, initiatives here, which is the Evidence to Practice program, which we are co-leading. Um, it's an initiative to provide uh, primary care partners and practitioners with digital interventions that seamlessly integrate into our point of care systems across Ontario. These are very comprehensive digital tools that become part of the EMRs and encourage best practices. We've just begun this initiative and we're hoping for a scalable approach that's going to support a provincial widespread use of the resource. And so again, we're branching out into this digital area and hoping that it's going to become an even bigger part of our, our programs moving forward. And so with that, I wanted to discuss a little bit um, about our academic detailing service. And I wanted to pause here and just ask the audience um, to maybe type in the chat if they've heard of our academic detailing service and if they have, if there's any words that they would use to describe it. So I'll give a moment for that and we'll just take a quick look at the chat to see. And thank you, Nicole. I see that you've posted in here the, um, 
links to our website, our COVID Resource Center, as well as the tools. So folks, please feel free to type in um, any words that you may have to describe our detailing service, or if you've never heard of it, that's okay too. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. We're actually hoping to sort of increase the profile of this service. Um, so let's see. Lisa Dolovich, everyone. Um, words I would use are well-respected, thorough, thank you. Um, that is something that we definitely strive towards um, since we do have the luxury of being having the time to prepare for these topics. Um, very comprehensive tools. Uh, Chris Spanlon, thanks. Chris is a colleague of mine. We used to work together at Mount Sinai. Also fabulous academic detailers. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, we do have some folks um, who have heard of us, which is uh, really gratifying to see and great to know that our pharmacy community is is um, aware of the service. We're hoping to raise even more awareness through um, chats like this. And um, yeah, wonderful to see that there's some awareness there. Um, I thought that since we're seeing some words like comprehensive, well-respected, thorough, I wanted to turn it over to Nicole to give us a bit of a definition and description of our academic detailing service. Thanks, Trish. And I'm so thrilled to hear that uh, the word is out there and we're, we're getting some uh, positive uh, responses from, from the group. That's fantastic to hear. So as you may have kind of alluded to, academic detailing is a form of educational edu uh, outreach that provides one-on-one -on -one discussions between a trained detailer and a participant to review objective, balanced, evidence-based information about best practice. Academic detailing isn't new. It's been around the world because it, it's been proven to facilitate practice change and improve patient outcomes. Academic detailing is well established in other countries, including the US, Australia, New Zealand, England, and the Netherlands, as well as a number of provinces across Canada since the early 90s. Since our academic detailing service in Ontario is a lot newer, <laughs> we're working to still raise that awareness, as Trish already mentioned. In our academic detailing service, all of our academic detailers are pharmacists, and we maintain our regular part-time practice to ensure that we are current in our clinical environments. We've been offering detailing to family physicians in Ontario for several years now, and we've just received funding to or approval to offer our services to nurse practitioners as well, which we're really excited about. We do try to connect with pharmacists that are connected with the physicians or nurse practitioners that we're seeing just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and we're able to facilitate that interprofessional collaboration. While these aren't official detailing visits, we do learn from the pharmacists and also share information that is being given to the providers just to make sure that that is a seamless um, intervention that we're able to help facilitate and, and they can go and run with it there. Next slide. So the benefits for providers are that we're giving balanced and evidence-informed information. We do tailor it to the physician's needs and availability. Uh, so we go in there and we figure out what does the physician already know? What are they hoping to learn? What are maybe some of those knowledge gaps that they don't know what they don't know? And what information and services may they actually uh, be able to use in their practice? We also um, will do the... Uh, confident, it's confidential and one-on-one, -on -one, sorry, and it's main pro accredited, as well as those relationships that we have. So over time, we're coming back and seeing the same provider. Our, our visits become more directed, more targeted, because we've gotten to know their practice a little bit more. We're available in between visits, too, to help answer emails or, or what was that one thing we talked about <laughs> that I can't remember anymore? I lost that handout that you sent me. So we really do build that relationship over time. Our funding for the academic detailing service it comes from the Ontario Ministry of Health. Next slide. Now over to Trish to talk a little bit more about that uh, that visit flow and what we do. Sure so our visits with clinicians follow a although each one is different they do follow a, a structure that makes sure that we do fully assess and meet everybody's needs and um, be sure to develop that long-term relationship. So we start off with a bit of an introduction. And now this is going to differ depending on, you know, whether we've met that clinician before. Um, 
And what we do is we sort of connect with them. We get to understand their practice. We ask things like, you know, do you have a lot of elderly patients? How large is your practice? You know, are you, what resources do you have? We get to know whether they're in a more remote area or if they have access to specialists and other resources like that, if they have access to a pharmacist on their team. And if they do, we'll connect with that person and sort of try to build that trust and credibility. And then the next step is related to the topic to just make sure that we are giving them exactly the information that they're looking for. Uh, so we'll ask things like, what do you see in your practice? What are you hoping to discuss today? What are your challenges? Nicole, does that sort of sound like what you've seen a visit? Any other things you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always start with what do they already know and what are they hoping to learn? And, and that's exactly it. Yeah, so we also, um, I find that some providers will do an EMR search ahead of time. So for example, for our falls uh, topic, some would do a search to find all the adults 65 plus and sort of get a look at them because they'd be the people to be targeting for this intervention. And I know, Nicole, you've been quite involved with the EMR searches. Can you comment at all on how the role that plays? Yeah, the EMR searches are fantastic. So I often will send physicians um, that are more tech savvy a search that uh, has often been created by our local partnering for quality team. Uh, so sometimes they'll run a search to identify all of their patients that are taking opioids so that they get a better idea of what they might be working with, what types of questions they might want to talk to me based on what they actually see in their practice. And then once I know what their challenges are, they might say, you know what, I have a lot of patients on oxycodone how do I rotate off of that? And we can go through some general options for rotation. And then I would also connect them with the pharmacist that's kind of working on their team or uh, direct them to review those with their community pharmacist. Or maybe they want to do an EMR search and figure out how many of my patients actually have an naloxone kit, which I always bring with me to my visits and help encourage them to make sure that they're, they're having access to naloxone kits for people on chronic opioids. Similarly, with our insulin topics, we've run insulin searches and talked talking about people maybe switching over from Lantus to Basaglar and facilitating that communication to the pharmacies that that is the intent with this new prescription or building in the LU code if they are to remain on Lantus. Mm, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, so you can see it can get quite into depth and very, very tailored to the, to the clinician. Um, and then the next part of the the visit once we understand the needs is to discuss what we call the key messages. And these are basically some key practice changes and or clinical pearls that we're hoping people will adopt. And they're based on, you know, best practices and evidence as well as care gaps. And so we, we communicate the ones that are relevant to that clinician and we're always checking in with them. So we try and visit to make sure we're not doing all the talking. <laughs> we ask a lot of questions, we do a lot of pausing and we make sure that we understand their challenges and barriers. And they can be anything from access, being able to afford the medication, not having anyone to refer out, lacking patient education. And for each topic, we're happy to be able to provide some resources, both from ourselves, as well as other, other stakeholders and partners to, to help address those barriers. And then finally, we do what's called a closing where we sort of summarize the key points. And then we also go a step further to ask for a bit of a commitment to sort of say, hey, you know, have you heard anything that would change your practice? Um, Nicole, how does that work for you in your visits? Yeah, so we've actually uh, undergone some recent retraining. And one of the other questions that we're going to be asking, or I'm personally going to start asking is, what might this look like in your practice? Can you imagine a patient that this would benefit? And really getting them to, to visualize and perhaps even put some reminders in the chart so that we really are taking that next uh, step because we know that case-based learning really does help and, and making it relevant and at their fingertips is really key to facilitating practice change. Yeah, so thanks, Nicole. After that, um, we are available through email or follow-up, and we generally will send a follow-up email after our visit containing the tool, answers to any questions that we've looked into for them or any key practice changes they wanted to make, as well as if they're uh, a physician, we'll add a main pro certificate as well. So because we're personalizing the information, no two visits are alike, and they could go in a hundred different directions. Um, just to illustrate a little bit, um, and in the interest of time, we will um, move through it fairly quickly, um, but just to illustrate the types of discussions that could be had, I'm gonna show a few things on the next screen here. So just for example, in our recent insulin topic, 
providers could fall into any number of different categories. And sometimes we like to think of sort of the profiles where people might be at. So some folks may be fully of referring out for insulin, not starting it at all. Uh, some are comfortable initiating a basal insulin and others, um, particularly those in remote areas are fully, fully comfortable with all forms of insulin, basal and prandial. So we meet them where they're at and we are ready to sort of answer whatever questions are related to that particular discussion. So for not starting insulin at all, the discussion may look like, hey, how do you talk to patients about insulin? What barriers might they have? Um, for people with basal comfortable level, that's where you start to say, well, which basal insulin do you use? How do you choose? Get them, you know, maybe familiar with the idea of, of, of a biosimilar, understanding the roles of the basal insulins in that particular patient where you might reach for a different one. And then those who are comfortable with basal and prandial getting into a more complex discussion, potentially around travel, meals, sick times, um, troubleshooting erratic blood sugars. And so it could go any number of different ways based on that. Um, and it also helps for those people who maybe don't know what they don't know, where they feel they have a high level of comfort and you can ask about recent cases and um, recent practice changes to see if they're familiar. Here's a, just a huge amount of possible ways that it could go. I've mentioned a lot of these already, monitoring um, the talking points and the complex situations, coverage, switching insulins, troubleshooting highs and lows. And um, I know there's one that probably you've discussed a lot, Nicole, as kind of a key point, the injection technique. Um, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I would say that it's really shocking to clinicians and it was shocking to us um, that when there is proper injection technique re-education, the A1C can drop by 0.5 to 1% and that the average Ontarian is making 3.5 errors with injection technique uh, based on recent studies. So I think those numbers and, and, you know, there are some really easy things we can do just as like giving a handout or going back to changing needles and, and reviewing the assistance devices uh, fund for needles for 65 plus are just really easy wins for for teams and for patients in actually improving patient care and clinical outcomes. Fantastic. And this is just a quick example of the type of algorithm you might see. This is for um, starting basal insulin. We also refer out to other handouts when there's a really great credible handout from another organization, we don't try to reinvent it. Um, so for example, this is one from the FIT injection technique. We also have used in other topics, things like the Canadian Deprescribing Network and power brochures when we spoke about benzodiazepines, um, materials from deprescribing.org. Um, and as we mentioned, the tool development process includes an environmental scan to identify these materials. Um, we also go through a pretty rigorous training, which we've actually just completed on our heart failure topic this week. Uh, it involves reviewing guidelines, um, major trials, resources, real world pearls, and our academic detailers are becoming increasingly involved in the tool development now that we recognize the value that they see in practically using these tools in the field. There's a lot of interprofessional communication that gets emphasized during our training about how to work with a team, how to understand the context that a physician or a nurse practitioner is working within, the importance of a pharmacist as a member of that team and a valuable resource, um, and also sort of learning from each other. So when we do visits, we also have the advantage that we can do this knowledge exchange where if you are seeing 1100 physicians and or nurse practitioners across the province, they've probably come up with some neat little tips and tricks they can use to um, sort of get past some common barriers. And it's great to be able to come and say, yes, that question you had is a common one and many others are struggling with it. Here's a few ways that people are handling this. Does that sound like something you could do? And it really does as a perspective that, you know, is not easy to get unless you're visiting all these providers. So. We do try to try offer that knowledge exchange as well. These are our current topics. Uh, we have four ongoing right now, heart failure I just mentioned, fall prevention, insulin for type two diabetes, as well as non-insulin pharmacotherapy. We've also have five other topics that have since retired, COVID, benzodiazepine use, um, opioid use disorder, chronic non-cancer pain, and opioid therapy. Now, each of these topics are certified for one main pro credit, and they also count towards the learning plan for nurse practitioners. So the addition of nurse practitioners is a very welcome and new addition. So with our upcoming topic, we're hoping to know more about uh, exactly um, everything that differs about them and what we can do to best support them. Um, and Nicole, I know you also had mentioned to me when we were discussing this talk about how we we're learning from each other. Um, any comment you wanted to make there? 
Yeah, I, I mean, we've got a fantastic team of family health team pharmacists, community pharmacists, hospital pharmacists, those practicing in, in long term care. We all have our own unique clinical expertise based on our, our past background. So we we have a lot of, of information that we really do bounce off of each other to try to make sure that we're catching all of the gaps potentially that may be seen in, in care. Thanks. And we also join the communities for our our topics. So for falls, we're into, you know, the loop uh, community of care. Um, we make sure we go to the conferences, we join as many CEs as possible, and we keep an ongoing, uh, we call it a Q&A document for post-training, all the questions and answers that come up so we don't have to duplicate each other when, when looking things up that come up in a visit. We've, as I mentioned before, over 1,100 family physicians have participated. There's been more than 2,900 visits. 98% um, of the physicians did indicate that it increased their ability to translate evidence into patient care, which was what we're aiming to do. And we've also seen some gains in deprescribing. Um, we have partnered with Mina Tadras at Women's College Hospital to evaluate the impact of the service, which we're hoping will lead to some future publications. Um, there is a testimonial video that we can provide a link to. Um, in the interest of time, I don't think I'll show it, but it just shows providers in their own words telling us what the service has meant to them and their practice. So I'm going to stop that and move to the next slide, which is future directions. Um, so here we're actually sort of hoping to get our audience to weigh in a little bit and uh, tell us um, what they would like to see. Uh, feel free to start typing in the chat if there's something that's resonated with you in terms of how you'd like to be involved as a pharmacist. Um, we are recruiting another academic detailer for our Northeast region. So if you know anyone who's interested, um, there's space for someone to do that as a really kind of fun part-time role. Um, we're hoping to increase our integration with multidisciplinary care. We have several pharmacists that are part of family health teams that detail their physicians. And we're really hoping to reach more pharmacists with news of the service and the tools that we have to offer and increase our reach to um, family physicians and nurse practitioners as well. Uh, we would love to hear more thoughts from you. Please type into the chat if there's anything that sparks your interest. And after that, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of this discussion. And also wanted to note that Nicole has posted a link to the demo, which is a demonstration of an actual detailing visit. It's easy for us to talk about what that involves, but it's sort of something you got to see for yourself. So many providers have said that to us that after they've had one, they, they tell their colleagues about it and they say, hey, there's nothing really like this. It's a very unique thing. It's very, you know, uh, tailored and confidential. And sometimes I think it gives people a way to speak to someone they wouldn't normally speak to and feel free to, you know, be, be very honest about challenges and issues that they're facing. So it, it's an example of about 10 minutes. Typically we run from about usually 30 minutes. Um, so it's a bit of a snapshot, but it does give a sense of the flavor of what we discuss and also the testimonials that are there. So yeah, welcome any in the chat. Um, otherwise, I would love to hand it over to Annalise to introduce our discussant. Thanks so much, Trish and Nicole. Um, quick question from Shelly, actually. I'll, I'll maybe um, just pose this one now, just kind of in the name of uh, you asking for some questions. Shelly's question, how often do you revisit the tools to make sure they're up to date? So great question, Shelly. Thank you. And it does vary according to the tool. So some tools become updated more quickly, depending on if new guidelines have been published, if there's a really important trial or a very important you know, change in practice, we'll update them a little faster. Um, others seem to be a little bit more timeless. So there's not a particular set um, time frame. But what we do is we have a um, information services team that monitors the literature. We have a clinical working group that also keeps us appraised of, you know, new developments in practice. And when we reach the point where we feel as though that tool needs to go through an overhaul, <laughs> that's when we start to take it down and go that, that direction. We also are moving towards a fully digital tool that can be updated on the fly when new information comes out. So we're shifting over from that model before we'd sort of printed them out, used them in our visits. A lot of people, you know, some folks like the paper and they like to have that piece of paper that they, they put up on their desk and refer to all the time, but we are recognizing the value of a fully digital HTML tool that can be updated when something new comes out. So kind of a bit of a, a work in progress and something that depends very much on how fast the evidence changes. Fantastic. Thanks, Trish. Um, yeah, definitely would be great to have that in digital form and, and real time. 
Um, thanks for tackling that. I'd like to introduce Alex Crawley next, um, who is a pharmacist who graduated from the University of Saskatchewan in 2012. He's been the Associate Director of RX Files Academic Detailing since 2018. He lives in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan with his wife and his son. And we're really happy that Alex is able to join us. Um, and thanks, Nicole, for showing that map. I think this is fantastic to have a bit more of a Canadian, um, pan-Canadian perspective and, and see Alex's remarks as the discussant from his practice area. Yeah, we should have had a pan we could have a panel of every one from every single program and the whole we could have had like 10 of us, right? All chatting together. I'll do a, a good land future direction. <laughs> That's right. I'll do a land acknowledgement. Um I'm on Treaty Six territory. I'm currently in Saskatoon, although uh, as Annalise said, I live in Prince Albert, but I work for the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, the University of Saskatchewan is committed to working towards honoring and supporting colonized lands and protecting the land in a way that demonstrates respect and love. Um, and it's a privilege really to share it with our Indigenous colleagues. Uh, Saskatchewan actually means in Cree, it means uh, the swift current. And so that's kind of a, I, I like that, I, I actually quite like that phrase because it reminds me that we're all kind of traveling along this river together. So a uh, few quick comments here uh, as I was listening to you guys' excellent presentation. My question for you guys actually is, do you guys feel like um, like academic detailing is, is kind of the the Cadillac of continuing education. Do you guys do you have the other feeling? For Trisha, I'm Trisha Nicole. That's who I'm talking to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I Nicole, please feel free to jump in. Uh, my thought on this is that it is unique. I'd say it's more of a unicorn. It's like <laughs> I don't think it's better than other forms, but I think it's definitely got its own flavor that makes it very different and very complementary to other forms of education in that what makes it different is the relationship building where um, as we see a clinician over time we come to know their practice we come to know their unique personality um, how they learn how they like to receive information and that allows us to be very tailored and very time efficient so I think that's what makes it different is that we get to know the needs of that person over time and that it's a it's a two-way street where we're learning from them as well um, and i think the other thing that makes us unique is not only our relationship with the individual practitioners but also as nicole was mentioning the fact that we have if we see 1100 physicians across the country we are exposed to a wide variety of different practice settings models philosophies ways of handling the, the challenges that face everyone in in primary care and so we're able to offer that unique perspective as well. Nicole, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question very much. And I also really like the unicorn answer. Um, I, I really think that there are a lot of preferences just in general for everything, right? So with CE, some people really like the actual relationships of going to a conference and the benefits of being able to chat with your colleagues and have that information exchange. They like their cruises. They like all of the different things that different forms of CE have to offer. I think what academic detailing has to offer is really that targeted approach. So you're not necessarily going to talk to the chief cardiologist who's got cutting edge research that's going to change the level of practice tomorrow, right? We're the boots on the ground people that are just trying to figure out what are the challenges in the day to day world and maybe perhaps a little less specialized, but we we try to make it practical uh, and really fine tune it to the individual learner. So I think there is a role for all forms of CE out there. What we hear from providers is is this really real? This sounds too good to be true, right? I can't believe that someone's gonna come and just talk to me for free about whatever I want with this topic. So that's that's one of the things that really resonates when people hear about our service. Mm -hmm, yeah. And, and uh, it can also be a really efficient way too of delivering information too. And I think a lot of providers get intimidated here in Saskatchewan and go, well, you know, I don't have time to sit down with you and talk for hours about this topic. Um, but but a lot of times a visit can be 10 minutes long or 15 minutes long and you can get a lot of if you've got if you got a good needs assessment going and you get in there you get inside the provider's head and you kind of know a little bit about his practice you can soup, 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 put in a few little practice gaps filled and in 15 minutes he's he's feeling already a little bit better about his particular uh his particular practice do you guys agree yeah 
Yeah, I've had my record is five minutes. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. And this is someone who was so fast paced that literally in five minutes, we'd cover what others would cover in 15. And I, I got to know this person and realized that that's the pace that he operates at. And the first time I actually met with him and he's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh no, he hates this. And at the end, he's like, that was great. Let's do that again. What's your other ones? And it was just the pace, right? You get to know. And whereas others, you can spend an hour and they would like to know all the evidence, all the studies that went into developing the tool. Um, you know, how are they going to implement this in their practice? What are other folks asking? So it, it varies quite a bit, it's, but it can be extremely time efficient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it can be, and it can be practice changing too, right? You know, like yes. that, that provider that listened very closely, he'll actually the next day, well, he'll prescribe a little differently now. And, and that's a nice, nice feeling for us. And hopefully a nice feeling for his patients too. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I was just going to add the shortest visit I had was 10 minutes on the phone from uh, from someone that was waiting for her car to be serviced because she right. forgot she booked the appointment with me, but she had left her phone number as a contact. So I called, realized that she was, you know, busy. And I said, let's reschedule. She's like, no, 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 I've, I'm waiting for my car. It's fine. Let's just stop now. So we talked on the phone. She thought it was great. She learned the one thing that she really wanted to learn for the day and then was on her way. Mm -hmm. so Very. Nicole, yes, was right. her car being detailed as she was being detailed? <laughs> I'm not sure what service it was for. Very, very good. Um, so we're called our Expels Academic Detailing in Saskatchewan, but a lot of people don't know us for academic detailing. Eh? They know us for our book and they know us for our charts that we put together. And uh, I had a little chuckle because Trish said that uh, that her chart had a lot of detail. And I thought to myself, you know, you're doing pretty good, Trish. We, we put too much detail and you guys are actually hitting a nice balance, I think. And, uh, and, and I guess my overall comment here, though, is that um, the reason we make the charts is to help us out with our academic detailing because we take the charts and visit with us. And without the academic detailing, we wouldn't have the book and we wouldn't bother publishing a book because, because it, the book is really driven by the detailing and, and not the other way around. And, uh, and so that's my little comment. But my question though for you guys is, do you feel like, uh, like it's easy to get caught up in the tools and, and get pulled away from the actual conversations? Um, and because one thing I like about CP is you got all these great tools on your website. And it maybe is tempting for some providers just to go to the tools and then and then not actually get the visit. Um, but I'd love to hear your comments on that. Mm. Well, we do have those who really love the tools. And what I'll sometimes get is that they've seen the tool and they have questions. Um, mm. And it comes from that. But I'd say every visit is very different. And what we try to do is make sure that it's always a conversation that we're never taking it over and that we're never overly relying on the material. So I would say that the tools are very much a supplement to what we're discussing. If we feel that a chart would be the right thing to bring out at that moment, we'll bring it out then, but it's very rare that we'll actually go through an entire tool with somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, one thing I want to throw you guys' way is that in Saskatchewan, we uh, we also focus mostly on um, physicians and nurse practitioners just like you guys, but lately we have started rolling it out to pharmacists, not, not so much one-on-one -on -one to pharmacists, but we do a big kind of province-wide pharmacy presentation a few times a year, and uh, and we get a few hundred pharmacists in the line. So actually, my question is for the audience. Um, I'm kind of curious if you guys can throw in the chat if you guys feel like you should be pressuring CEP into offering big continuing ed for pharmacists around the, around the whole province as well and getting big groups of pharmacists together listening into the CEP talks. So if you guys think that's a good idea, put it in the chat and then these guys can take it to their bosses and say, we, we've got the demands now. <laughs> I see you laughing there, Nicole. <laughs> we'll have to start one of those survey polls, get everyone to sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, petition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one more thing, I guess, for you guys. Uh, I saw you guys had the COVID topic. My guess is that the docs that you guys visited were really eager to hear about that topic. And uh, I'm just curious if you want to comment on that. But I, I bet you they must have felt like you were like, I don't know, bringing the man out a little bit, eh? Honestly, yeah, I we were ready to start detailing about PPI deprescribing when uh, when COVID hit, and we were all excited for that. There was a tool already made for it. We were we were gung ho on on that, and uh, 
And then all I can hear right now is Ross Geller in my mind saying, pivot, pivot. And we all of a sudden are thrown into helping create this COVID resource center. And they're like, you know what? We need to get you talking to people about it too. And we're like, what is this, you know, scheduling virtual appointments? We don't, we don't do that. What is, what is this helping uh, coach people through IPAC and, and, you know, all of the diagnostic and all of this kind of crazy stuff, but it, it was a need that needed to be filled by someone. So we were constantly reading and training and referring and figuring out where the credible resources were, rereading things every day, just like everybody else. And it was terrifying, but it was so very appreciated by the phys physicians that we spoke with. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the comments I had. I thought that was a really enjoyable presentation. Um, I think uh, I think uh, folks in Ontario would be wise to take advantage of you guys. You guys are they're lucky to have you guys as a resource. That's kind of my final thoughts. Yeah. Thanks for going easy on us, Alex. No, oh yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Alex, and thanks for posing some, some initial questions to Trish and Nicole and just getting that conversation going. I think it brings up a number of, of interesting areas, um, and I know there's a few questions in the chat, but maybe just wanting to build off of, um, Alex, the, the momentum to kind of, you know, bring this into the forefront for, for pharmacists as well, um, I think just kind of gets me interested sort of about your relationship, maybe RX Files and CEP with regulators, CE providers, educators, like to me, this seems like an incredibly important area for pharmacists to have an enormous impact both within their own profession, but also within the interprofessional environment. Um, so curious if, if any of you wanna to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many comments I have there. Why don't you guys go first? Nicole, did you want to take the first crack? I want to make sure I'm understanding the question properly. Sorry, Annalise. Yeah, no worries. Just curious about like your relationship with regulators. Um, you talked about, you know, the main pro certification, but that's yeah. really, I think, to the best of my knowledge for family physicians. So your relationship with regulators, with continuing education providers in pharmacy um, and with educators, because this seems like something that should be at the frontier of how we're teaching future pharmacists and how how current pharmacists are also you know being educated. Yeah, so I, I can say um, from a higher level that uh, CEP is like involved with all of the main pro accreditation with the OMA. Um, they have very close relationships with them. Um, I know with topics as they relate to pharmacy, we have contacts with OCP um, as well as OPA, and we do try to circulate information around. Uh, we have had discussions about doing presentations to various groups, and we have been involved with like NPAO um, at local levels, we have a lot of contacts where we're doing webinars or presentations at a local grassroots level. Uh, many of us are working with universities right now. So um, working with Western to see about being involved with uh, some of their um, academic half days. I know a few of the other detailers are working with their local universities to be involved in half days. So the regulator side of things, I know that CP is involved with it. I'm not in those conversations, but we do try to punt over things that we think are relevant um, when possible. I don't know, Trish, if you have more to add on that. Yeah, so thanks, Nicole. That's a really great summary. It's um, We are currently authorized to offer our visits to physicians and nurse practitioners as the official, that's what's it, it we have permission based on our funding from the Ministry of Health. And so our involvement with official regulators has been in those two camps. So the OMA and providing the MEPRO credits, the MPAO and doing kind of the how does this work? Are we going to give a certificate for their learning plan? So that's where it's been so far. I think this ties in well with Lisa Dolovich's question in the chat about how have you integrated CEP AD materials into formal curriculum for health science students? And what advice would you have for us at our pharmacy school to incorporate some of the helpful training academic detailers go through to build skill for pharmacy students? I love that you've asked that question because this is something Nicole alluded to that we're just in the early stages now of 
going where more established uh, detailing services have gone, such as RX Files, in developing relationships with our local universities. And the opportunity to speak here is sort of a, a first step that we really value because um, we're really hoping that what we can do is actually start to offer some value to the health science universities to say, hey, maybe we can provide a lecture on persuasive communication with, with prescribers, or maybe we can have a little to say about um, interprofessional collaboration skills or evaluating the literature or in sort of tool development, the, those types of things there's that where detailers have developed a skill. We're looking uh, for partnerships to be able to say, hey, can we give a talk? Can we give a journal club? Can we be a guest at one of the lecturers to sort of talk about the training we go through? And there is a pretty extensive set of training on just the communication skills, the listening skills, the ability to build those relationships. And then there's the more specific topic training that's probably of value too. So I'd say we're very interested in that. And we're sort of at the early stages of reaching out to pharmacy schools, uh, medical schools, nursing schools, and any other health science just to say, hey, we've got these tools. How can we be of use to you? Uh, so definitely looking for ideas there. But we're hey, really- Those are some, some cool ideas, Trish. And we're actually part of the University of Saskatchewan here at ArxVelf. And, uh, and so we do a little bit of teaching on the uh, critical appraisal side of things. And then we do a little bit of teaching around some of the lectures that some of our our pharmacists feel like they're real content experts in. So a few of those little lectures. And so it is neat being, you know, somewhat integrated that way. And, uh, and it sounds like there's a little bit of appetite on CEP side and the university side over in Toronto too, which is neat to see. And I was just going to add, um, I've done a few guest lectures uh, for the University of Waterloo in the past uh, related to academic detailing as a career. Uh, so that's another angle where just getting the awareness that this is a maybe a non-traditional role of a pharmacist and and uh, hopefully drumming up some interest in that as a potential career going forward. We've also worked with some topic experts from universities in the creation of our tools. So uh, I know that kind of it goes both ways where we we appreciate that um, some of the professors at universities may have that clinical expertise or ability to lend in on the, the topics that we're, we're building tools around, and especially the COVID resource center, I know. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all for your, your comments on that question. Um, flipping back just up to the top of our chat, um, another question from Shelley. Are there, are there topics that you feel less comfortable talking about? For example, diagnostics, maybe non-pharmaceutical modalities and chronic pain, and how do you navigate that finding common ground and language so that you understand each other well? Fantastic question and very relevant. That's something we deal with with every single topic. And the way that we handle this is to say, there's going to be a sandbox in which we can feel confident in our training and preparation, where we have a team behind us of experts in searching the literature, clinician experts in the area. You know, it's sometimes it's specialists, sometimes it's family physicians with a focused practice who have advised and trained us on evidence, best practices, and the types of discussions we're likely to have. So we can go into those feeling fairly confident about the things that we feel qualified to say. And then there are certain points where we just have to draw a line where the discussion gets to a certain point. We say, you know, that's a great question. Um, here's what we have on this, on this topic. If you'd like, I can follow up with a specialist for you, another physician, and get back to you with an answer on that. So we sort of draw a sandbox of here's where we're confident responding based on our training. And sometimes those are non-pharmacist things, such as um, you gave a great example, Shelley, of the non-farm modalities and chronic pain. That was a huge part of what we were discussing. And we felt confident discussing that because, you know, just as a pharmacist would counsel a patient on the non-pharmacological options for various conditions, we feel as though you know, by the time we get to the end of our training, we feel pretty confident offering that information. Uh, but yes, certainly it might get into the kind of thing as for example, heart failure, where are we going to tell a physician how to look at an echocardiogram? Probably not, uh, but we can provide the resources and the help to connect them. And particularly in chronic pain and our opioid topics, we actually had clinicians who offered themselves to say, hey, if there's a clinician who wants to start suboxone on a patient, send them my way and I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk them through it and help them help them out. So generally speaking, if we don't have the answer and we don't feel confident and, and prepared to offer that answer, and we have to know where our limits are, we're able to connect them with someone who can help us. Right. Alex, similar in your environment? 
Yeah, I would say so. We tend to really focus hard on drug related topics. And uh, just as Trish said, that's our zone. Yeah, so we, we try to stay there. <laughs> that's great. Um, just looking through the chat uh, still, I think more of a comment from Lori. She said the other problem, we had moved a number of patients back to H2 antagonists and then there was a supply shortage and they went back. Um, sounds very frustrating. Any comments, Trish, Nicole, uh, Alex on, on that scenario and, and if that's uh, happened in your environment as well? Yeah, I, I'm speaking more from my hospital job right now in that this has been such an immense source of frustration and difficulty over the last couple of years, particularly with supply chain issues. Um, it's one of those things we all have to deal with on a daily basis. Unfortunately, we didn't get to detailing on this topic. So the question never came up for us as, as detailers, but I can definitely appreciate the frustration. Yeah, no, no other real comments here. Great. Um, I know we have about five minutes left, so I'll see if there's any other questions from the audience. Um, but maybe just from, from my end, I was really interested in what you discussed with the evidence to practice and kind of rolling out, um, considering rolling out and kind of branching into that virtual care space. And I know there was a comment in the chat of, you know, virtual and extending beyond the GTA would be great. So just curious if, if you could speak a little bit more to that and maybe some of the challenges you have worked through or are currently working through um, and moving into that area. I think I might be able to speak a little bit to that. So we are, the evidence to practice group actually right now is three organizations. It's the Center for Effective Practice with the eHealth Center for Excellence or ECE, which is out of Waterloo, as well as North York General Hospital as the initial pilot kind of lead testing site. So right now um, they're really just trying to create the pilot initial phases of things that then will be rolled out provincially. They are trying to capture both primary care and institutional care so that it will actually uh, be able to flow properly between transitions and care. So the original pilot topic is about heart failure and the models being developed in TELUS, practice solutions to start, and then it will go into Acuro and then other EMRs. They have to start somewhere. Um, so that's that's the starting point and they're starting the, the trials in, in pilot sites that have signed up, but I know they are going to take additional sites that are interested. Once they've kind of got the kinks worked out, it will potentially be going out uh, provincially. I'm not sure what the timeline is but with that. And then North York General Hospital is the pilot institutional site. I believe they have other pilot institutional sites for other topics. Our next topic will be anxiety and depression that is going to come out sometime the fall or in the spring or summer. And I know for that one, they're definitely flipping over to a curo as the initial testing uh, EMR. So they are trying to be equi equitable with what they're testing in the order they're testing things in, but it is supposed to be a multi-phase project that is going to be stepped out in a very interesting tandem type of uh, process. And I'm really excited to see. It is intended to be provincial though. Great, thanks so much, Nicole. Well, on behalf of the Center for Practice Excellence, I would like to say thank you. I'm going to pass it back over to Zubin um, just to close us out, but thank you so much um, for a fantastic presentation. And Alex, thanks for joining from, from Saskatchewan for your remarks as well. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to be here. And let me add my thanks to Annalise. Um, I hope this is not the first time that you have ever heard of the Center for Effective Practice or of academic detailing. I'm also sure it's not going to be the last time. This is a topic that's really important to the profession of pharmacy, um, perhaps really important to pharmacy curriculum and educators as well. So we're looking forward to continuing our discussions with Trish. Uh, with CEP and uh, with the entire group that's involved in all of this. So thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing your thoughts today. Thank you to the audience for attending today. And we remind you that this is uh, an ongoing speaker series. We have a couple of exciting events coming up in the months ahead, including a, uh, a signature event in the in coming up in a couple of months focused on environmental sustainability in pharmacy. Please go to our website and uh, please attend and spread the word to your colleagues. We hope you attend. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much, Trish. And thanks so much, Alex. Have a great uh, evening and happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you, Zubin. And, and thanks to Zubin and Annalise for the opportunity to be here with you today. And thanks to all of you for your attention and open-mindedness and interest in our service.
Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.